very much. Welcome to the fourth nurse webinar of 2018, Nursing Solutions, Music as a Therapeutic Modality in Parkinson's Disease. These nurse webinar series showcase the work of our nurse scholars who completed the Edmund J. Safra Visiting Nurse Faculty Program at the Parkinson's Foundation. Today's webinar features Deborah St. Anthony, nursing faculty at Normandale College in Bloomington, Minnesota, and Diana Neal, Associate Professor of St. Olaf's College in Northfield, Minnesota. I'll tell you more about our speakers in just a minute. Before we start the webinar, I'd like to touch on a few housekeeping items. The PowerPoint slide deck can be downloaded from the reminder email you received this morning or from the Parkinson's Foundation webpage, which is www.parkinson.org, or on the page you're looking at to the left. Health professionals can earn one free CEU through the American Society on Aging. Participants will receive an email after today's webinar with steps on how to collect the one CEU. You have just 30 days when the CEU is available, which is until January 4th, 2019. However, all of the webinars are archived and can be viewed at any time. Please note that questions can be submitted during the presentation by clicking in the text messaging box in the bottom left corner, type your question, and then hit send. So when we think about music and Parkinson's disease, we wonder, can music ease the symptoms of Parkinson's disease? And I think at the end of this program, you'll agree with me that there is a very important role for music in easing the symptoms. We know that Parkinson's is chronic and progressive and has motor and non-motor features. We know that pharmacological and surgical interventions may help. We also know that non-pharmacological interventions, such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, yoga, boxing, tai chi, and many others can help. So where does music fit in in the treatment of Parkinson's symptoms? Well, music is the universal language. The definition uh, given by the American Music Therapy Association is that through music in a therapeutic context, clients' abilities are strengthened and transferred to other areas of their lives. Music therapy provides avenues for communication that can be helpful to those who find it difficult to express themselves in words. In other words, Hans Christian Andersen says, where words fail, music speaks. And one of my favorite musicians, Elton John, also says that music has healing powers. It has the ability to take people out of themselves for just a few hours. Our objectives for today's webinar are to discuss the research related to music interventions for those with Parkinson's disease, to describe music techniques such as rhythmic auditory stimulation, pattern sensory enhancement, and therapeutic instrumental music performance. We'll contemplate throughout how music can be incorporated into the daily care of one with Parkinson's disease. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker will be Deborah St. Anthony. Deborah is a faculty member at Normandale College in Bloomington, Minnesota. Her teaching focus is transitional and long-term care, and she is currently pursuing a doctorate in nursing in adult and geriatric nursing. Deborah has a passion for music, and she plays the piano, trumpet, and violin. Directly following Deborah will be Diana Neal. Dr. Neal is an Associate Professor of Nursing at St. Olive's College in Northfield, Minnesota, where she was previously the Chair of Nursing and also the Director of the Minnesota Intercollegiate Nursing Department. Dr. Neal has a PhD in nursing from the University of Minnesota and carried a minor in complementary therapies and healing practices. 
Both Deborah and Diana are Edmund J. Safra Nurse Scholars, having attended our host site at Struthers Parkinson's Center in 2017. They have begun their work in music and Parkinson's, and their article is pending publication, which is entitled, Take Note, Music Interventions to Ease the Symptoms of Parkinson's Disease. At this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Deborah and Diana, and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, we're happy to be here this afternoon to share with you some of the creative musical interventions that can be added to our toolkit of strategies uh, to ease some of the chronic and often troublesome uh, symptoms that oftentimes patients with Parkinson's disease experience. So it's always good to add, a, I think, a new strategy, a new intervention, a positive intervention to kind of take a holistic approach to the patient care and the plan of care. Uh, we'll focus on three common areas and we'll explore some rather easy to use musical interventions that can be used in the day-to-day -day plan of care of patients with Parkinson's. Uh, these strategies can be used by nurses, by caregivers, family members, and certainly patients as well to sort of ease some of those troublesome symptoms that they frequently uh, experience. I developed an interest in this topic. As Gwen had mentioned, I was a participant in the Edmund J. Safra Visiting Nurse Faculty Program. And when I wrote an evaluation of that experience, I remember that I said, for me, it was really a life-changing experience. It really gave me an opportunity to not only learn from the healthcare team, the new uh, interventions and treatment approaches for Parkinson's, but most interesting was hearing as well the patient's perspective and uh, putting some real life experiences into how they effectively deal with their uh, chronic condition. So I think um, in addition to learning a lot, I think that our experts uh, on this topic really are the patients that are uh, dealing with the day-to-day -day, uh, symptoms that they're feeling and, and many patients have developed really positive uh, lifestyle changes that have really improved their um, overall um, quality of, of life. So that's how I developed my interest. In addition to that program, at the same time, I am a clinical nursing faculty instructor at Normandale, and the clinical site that we were using at that time is a long-term care facility that had uh, a number of acute care beds as well, and uh, frequently it was a referral center for patients that were at various stages of Parkinson's. So one particular day as I was working with students, I assigned this patient, uh, a 68-year-old retired airline pilot. He was admitted to long-term care to the facility about six months ago. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease about 10 years prior to that time. So he was a little bit younger than I, uh, what you would expect your average patient with a diagnosis of Parkinson's uh, disease to be, uh, about 58 at the time of diagnosis. He had a wife of about 30 years, he had two adult daughters, and he was experiencing uh, an increase in motor symptoms. He was uh, developing rigidity, kind of a loss of balance, and this was really affecting his ability to safely be independent at home, and he was experiencing some falls. And so he decided himself, along with his family, that it would be best for him to uh, go to a long-term care facility that could better uh, meet his needs and not have the safety concerns and the falls that he was experiencing. So that particular morning in nursing report, we were told that he was experiencing some falls and to really watch him closely and he had received a new walker and his meds were adjusted and that we should just keep a really good eye on him that day. So the very conservative uh, instructor that I am, uh, I don't ever want a patient to experience a fall, but particularly not when they have a student nurse assigned to them. So I assign not one, but two nursing students to provide care for him that particular day 
plus every moment that I had, I also felt that I needed to be in the room to uh, just make sure that this patient didn't fall. So the poor gentleman, as I think about it, um, he was getting ready for breakfast and he was in his uh, bathroom, and we were all in the bathroom with him. So there was four of us. It wasn't that big of a bathroom. He decided that he wanted to stand up to brush his teeth, that's certainly a reasonable request, and literally the three of us were hovering over this, this man, uh, having our hands on either side of him, kind of from head to toe, and just making sure that any little move, if he were to, to have any problems at all, that we would catch him. And so, thankfully, at the end of the day, um, he did not fall, and we have uh, said our goodbyes to him, and uh, he was probably kind of happy to see us all go uh, in reality. Uh, but we had a post-conference, which we always do with students, took a few minutes, and then I proceeded um, at the end of the day to go to my car. And as I sat there, Watching, this facility is in a kind of a, a neighborhood of houses and uh, has a long um, sidewalk that was right in front of me and a, a park area. And here before my eyes was this gentleman uh, that we had hovered over all day. Uh, his wheelchair, transfer belt, and walker were sitting at the end of the block, and he was jogging uh, with the physical therapist. He, the physical therapist didn't have one hand on him. His gait was steady. His balance was good. He was going at a good pace. I'm not sure if I could have kept up with him. He um, ran the length of a, of a city block, and then he stopped for a moment with the therapist. The therapist took his arm. They waited a moment, and then he jogged all the way back to his chair and um, safety belt and walker and sat down. And I was just mystified. Here I had, uh, three of us, had uh, not hardly let him brush his teeth without us being there, and here he was jogging. So I just developed an interest in this idea, and uh, as you think about it, when you jog or run or march, there is a certain cadence or a rhythm to how you move. And I became fascinated with that idea and that idea of music therapy and mobility. So the next day when I went back to the um, facility, I talked with a the physical therapist and I said, I was just amazed. I, uh, tell me about this. And he said, this is a very effective strategy for this gentleman, but also for patients in general, that, um, that, that rhythm, that beat, that cadence, that music really promotes their um, mobility and ability to balance and their gait. So that's how I kind of developed an interest in this, in this whole area. So what I'd like you to look at next is a short video. This is a, an example of a physical therapist in a patient's home uh, using music to help the patient uh, walk and improve their gait. As you look at this, you might just want to adjust the volume on your device that you're using. Um, as you look at this, I would like you to think about and, and observe, which will be easier to, easy to do, how music changes his gait and balance. Uh, he is walking to a country western song, it's um, Don Williams, and the name of the song is Good Old Boys Like Me. Also take a look at the anticipation that he experiences before he starts to walk because that's a big part of this whole process. He kind of feels the beat and sort of uh, moves to the, to the cadence of the rhythm. So take a look, it's very short, and then we'll talk about it a little bit after. And you might notice it takes just a little bit of a delay before this play, so just please be patient. Monetize the video, letting everybody know about this cool little study I came across. Um, it's actually been out for quite a while, but I didn't know about it, so I wanted to, you know, let other therapists know. I've had great results with this guy. Um, we're going to demonstrate walking with no music first, just to kind of show the gait pattern. He's got Parkinson's, and so usually, you know, he's got the typical kind of shuffling gait pattern and difficulty with um, smooth gait cadence. Then I'll show a video with the music, and you'll see the difference.
um, gay training with music. Everybody's got cell phones. Everybody nowadays has music on their phone, so this is kind of a real easy way to do it. We'll stand here for a minute. We'll get the rhythm. Once we fill it, then we'll take off. What did you think? Very dramatic change from scraping and dragging that walker to actually dancing uh, with the therapist. So music and the brain, uh, very interesting connections that occur as we process music and certainly impacts our behavior in a variety of different areas. Music, whether playing an instrument or singing, using the instrument of one's voice, involves a very integrative process of the auditory and sensory, sens excuse me, auditory, sensory, motor, and many other regions of the brain. If you look at the auditory cortex, this helps us as we listen to sounds, as we perceive and analyze tones. The sensory cortex controls tactile feedback while we're playing an instrument or dancing. The visual cortex involves reading music or looking at our own dance moves. Uh, the motor cortex is involved in movement while we're dancing or playing an instrument. And then the amygdala is also interesting, which involves many of the mo emotional reactions to music. So this process really leads to a strong correlation between perception and action. Um, additionally, listening to music can really link perception and cognitive function. It helps with attention, memory, executive function, as well as emotional well-being. So this unique interaction uh, occurs primarily between the auditory and the motor systems of the brain, as you can see visualized here. The auditory system is actually much faster and it's more precise than the visual and tactile systems. So it sort of primes, if you will, the motor systems into a state of readiness before we get ready to move. This priming really increases not only the quality, but also the timing of the motor response. So the steps become uh, more balanced and they also become longer. I talked about anticipation. Did you see that gentleman in the movie, or in the video, he sort of took a moment 
to kind of think about and sort of get the rhythm, that's really a critical element in improving movement quality. Rhythm provides that anticipatory time cue for the brain to kind of plan and get ready before the person actually starts to move. So music affects different parts of the brain. When we listen to music, the right side of the brain is primed and activated, and this involves emotions and feelings. Then the left side of the brain will analyze what we've just heard and um, help us with skills such as language and logic. So I think we've all had that experience where you hear a song and it instantly brings you back to a specific moment in time. Tout, one of the researchers who did a lot of studies on music and how it impacts the brain, uh, used the statement of oftentimes couples say, honey, they're playing our song. And just hearing that song can instantly take you back to a specific moment in time and a, and a, and a memory in time. And this certainly helps. We'll talk about how this helps with um, confusion and dementia. Entrainment is also a very interesting concept to think about. This is defined as a temporary locking process in which one system's motion or signal frequency synchronizes the frequency of another system. This was actually discovered in the 1960s by a Dutch physicist, his name was Christian Hugens, when he noted that the pendulum frequencies of two clocks mounted on the same wall or board became synchronized to each other. In entrainment, the different amounts of energy that are transferred between the moving bodies um, actually cause a negative feedback loop. And slowly over time, uh, the faster frequency adjusts to the slower frequency. And this concept can be directly applied up to the connectivity that occurs between those auditory areas and the motor areas of the brain that um, cause this locking mechanism to occur. Another interesting idea is this uh, idea of neuroplasticity. And that's the ability of the brain to reorganize itself, both in structure and how it functions. And when I was in school years ago, we were taught that once those neurons were damaged, there was no, no regeneration, no return. And so this is very interesting in, um, through the use of a variety of techniques, including music, neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to create new neural pathways or new roadways, if you take a look at the diagram on, diagrams on the bottom, sort of retraining and rewiring, if you will, the pathways that bypass those dysfunctional brain regions that often occur are very common in many neurological um, conditions. So thinking back, we're going to try to focus on three primary areas of symptoms that are common in Parkinson's patients and uh, try to apply some musical interventions. When you think about motor symptoms, I've talked about this a little bit, um, the gait, these gait characteristics are oftentimes the most common cause of decreasing a person's functional abilities. And frequently this limits independence and really causes a person to be at great risk for falls and is one of the primary reasons that a person has to be institutionalized. And so um, that becomes a significant factor in a person's quality of life. The second area that we're going to talk about is communication and speech and swallowing issues. And we know that about 80% of Parkinson's disease patients have um, changes in their voice and speech. Decrease in the loudness, they have a real breathy tone to their speech, and pitch and loudness also decreases. This makes communication difficult. Uh, they also have kind of that classic um, masked face appearance. And that's caused by a decrease in dopamine, which requires, uh, which helps the muscles. When we smile, did you know that we use about 12 different muscles? And when you frown, you, lose about, you use about 11 different muscles. And so oftentimes family members really feel that their uh, significant other isn't, ex isn't, isn't expressing emotions when in fact they're not truly able to. So we'll talk a little bit about that and the fact that those same muscles that you use for smiling and frowning are also involved in eating and swallowing, and so aspiration becomes a, um, a concern. 
So we'll talk about some strategies, and um, singing is a, one very effective one. And the last area that we'll talk about is cognitive anxiety and depression problems, uh, and we'll discuss ways that music will, will help with um, some of those functions. Parkinson's disease, as Gwen had uh, defined, is a chronic progressive uh, disorder that occurs. And one of the challenges with treatments is oftentimes medications reach a point where the same dose does not provide the same effect. And we, we call this an on-off phenomenon, where the same routine uh, all of a sudden doesn't provide the effectiveness uh, in many different areas of function that it used to. So if you can see in this diagram a normal neuron and the production of dopamine and how that promotes nice, smooth, steady movements. If you don't have that production of dopamine, that's why Parkinson's patients oftentimes have these quick, jerky movements because nerve cells fire kind of out of control, leaving the patient unable to control and um, direct those movements. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Diana, and she's going to talk about some specific strategies. Okay, this is Diana Neal, and I will be describing uh, music interventions to help ease some of the challenges of Parkinson's disease that Debbie discussed. Before I do that, there are three music techniques described by Dr. Michael Tout, Professor of Music and Neuroscience at the University of Toronto, which are specifically used to improve sensory motor function. The first music technique, Rhythmic Auditory Stimulation, or RAS, uses cues with a rhythm such as a metronome or strongly accentuated beat to facilitate movement like walking. The research comes from, that this comes from is a study by Gran, which uses functional magnetic resonance imaging um, to show that those with Parkinson's disease do not experience the same internal generation of a beat as those without PD and need externally cued beats to maintain that connectivity between the basal ganglia and cortical motor areas of the brain involved at the coordination of movement. An example of RAS comes from Debbie's story about the 68-year-old airline, uh, retired airline pilot with PD who experienced several falls in a long-term care facility. Debbie said that she assigned two students to care for this patient because she was concerned for his safety and they hovered over him the entire shift. At the end of the day, Debbie saw the same man jogging and walking steadily without his walker. The video clip that Debbie played should sh um, explain or show how this could occur. Okay. The second sensory motor music technique is pattern sensory. Oh yeah, excuse me. I'm actually going to play a little um, piece of music that shows um, this this rhythmic marching. Um, marching. and beat can get somebody moving a bit. So the next sensory motor music technique is pattern sensory enhancement, which uses the elements of music to facilitate movements to help those with Parkinson's disease perform activities of daily living, such as dressing, grooming, eating, and transferring from a bed to a chair, for example. A 2017 article in JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association, described a project using pattern sensory enhancement founded by Ollie Westheimer, a dance student and executive director of the Brooklyn Parkinson Group, a support group for patients with PD and their caregivers. The author of the article discussed that people with PD often have trouble with movement sequencing, getting from point A to point B, which is precisely the specialty of choreographers who use complex movement plans to transport dancers from points A to B in a creative, expressive fashion. In 2000, Ollie started Dance for PD classes taught by professional dancers from the Mark Morris Dance Group in Brooklyn, which has now grown to include 100 communities in 16 countries. The example of pattern sensory enhancement is from a story told by a caregiver spouse of a woman with PD who is experiencing a decline in mobility. 
the husband was having increased difficulty with transferring his wife. He had to lift her from bed to the chair and was reluctant to tell the health care providers for fear that he would be, she would be taken from their home and placed in the facility. He told his health care team that for years he and his wife had enjoyed polka dancing together. One day, polka, dance, polka music was playing on the radio and his wife stood up and they began dancing. Through work with therapists, dancing became a strategy to improve mobility, transfers, and help to maintain their at-home living situation. Here's some music. instrument music performance. Music instruments are played by those with Parkinson's disease to improve functional movements for dressing, grooming, eating, and transferring. It also helps to improve range of motion, limb coordination, and finger dexterity. A recent research study by Bukowska found that percussion instruments like drums improve mobility and stability during rehabilitation with Parkinson's patients. As part of the Edmund J. Soffer Visiting Nurse Faculty Program for Parkinson's Education, Debbie and I completed, completed training through the Struthers Parkinson Center in Minnesota. There, we had the opportunity to participate in two days of training as well as 16 hours of clinical at the center where we observed a neurologic music therapist trained in a research-based system of 20 standardized clinical techniques for sensory motor, speech and language, and cognitive training developed by TOUT. During my clinical observation, I observed an outpatient therapeutic day program with, music, with a music therapist working with people who had moderate to severe PD symptoms. The participants were very quiet as they were brought into the music therapy room, many by wheelchair. Some dozed in their chairs while others looked down at the floor. After a brief introduction, the music therapist passed out various sizes of drums and played the Bill Haley song, Rock Around the Clock. Everyone in the group played their drums during the refrain, but only those whose number was called were to play during their verse. The group was attentive during the song, waiting for their verse, during which their arm movements became much more pronounced while drumming. By the end of the song, nearly everyone was smiling and more animated with increased range of motion and drumming movements during the refrain as well. So we're going to play just a piece of that rock around the clock, and feel free to get up and dance or whatever you need Tap to do your to move. Toe. Feel the music. <laughs> One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. Put your flat rags on, join me home. used to improve sensory motor function. We're now going to look more specifically at how music can ease sensory motor challenges as well as the other challenge areas in Parkinson's disease that Debbie discussed, including speech, language, and swallowing, cognition, and psychosocial and emotional well-being. Debbie and I developed music care plans for symptoms within each of these major areas. For each symptom, we describe the specific challenges for those with PD, the type of music interventions recommended for use with each challenge, and the expected outcome for how music may help to ease the particular symptoms of PD. For motor challenges, as uh, we just discussed the three techniques, moving or dancing to music may help to reduce shaking and tremors. A metronome, tapping or drumming may help initiate movement and improve the flow of walking, increase the length and speed of strides, and reduce episodes of freezing and falls. Movement to music or dancing may help to initiate movement of the arms and hands as well as assisting with reaching, grasping, lifting, and transferring as it did with the husband and wife while dancing to polka music. Playing musical instruments may also help to improve range of motion, coordination, and finger dexterity. Moving limbs with music or dancing to music may reduce stiffness and rigidity of arms and legs, increasing range of motion, improving flexibility, and strengthening muscles used for activities of daily living. 
and a metronome tapping drumming or dancing to music with a strong beat may also help to strengthen posture and improve balance. For speech, language, and swallowing challenges, singing may increase vocal intensity, control, and posture during strengthening muscles in the diaphragm, abdomen, and back, especially when using strong inhalations and long exhalations. This is really important for um, those who have difficulty with soft speech and uh, to make sure that they're understood and may be able to communicate. Singing songs where words are repeated over and over again can help with remembering words and subject matter. Singing may also improve swallowing and prevent aspiration by strengthening the same muscles used for speaking um, that Debbie just discussed, um, and also enhance facial expressions that are so important to communicating and expressing motions by strengthening muscles of the face, tongue, neck, and chest. For cognitive challenges, singing and drumming, dancing or playing instruments with verbal cues to stop continue or change the activity, such as the example I discussed where Rock Around the Clock was played in the music therapy class. Words in the song were used to cue the playing of individual participant drums and help to focus attention as well as to improve range of motion and motor coordination using therapeutic instrumental music performance. So that TIMP can be used for both the motor, sensory motor challenges and cognitive challenges. Next, listening to familiar songs or singing songs where words are repeated over and over again can help trigger and elicit memories. And singing simple songs with made up lyrics that include a specific plan, decision, or instructions that a person wants to remember can help with juggling multiple tasks. For psychosocial and emotional challenges, singing may be used to express emotions and listening to familiar or uplifting music may be used to improve mood, emotional connection, and socialization, or to reduce anxiety, promoting comfort and relaxation. Singing and listening to familiar or enjoyable uplifting music may also be used to improve mood, emotional connection, and socialization, and help to reduce apathy by helping get the person up and willing to engage in activities by shifting their focus. Um, one thing to remember is that the key for these types of musical in interventions is for the music to be chosen by the person based upon his or her preferences. If the person doesn't really like the particular type of music, it's really not necessarily going to help them. So, as you might have figured out, these different examples of music interventions, um, through these mu different examples of music interventions, music may be applied to a variety of other conditions for those facing challenges with mobility, speech, cognition, and psychosocial well-being. Healthcare professionals, caregivers, and family members may use music to ease the symptoms of their patients and loved ones in very simple, cost-effective ways to facilitate day-to-day -day activities and enhance overall quality of life. Promoting an awareness of the benefits of music for persons living with PD and other chronic disorders is the first step in utilizing music as a powerful therapeutic intervention. So Debbie and I would now like to share one last video clip showing Naomi Fail, a social worker and founder of Validation Therapy, during a breakthrough moment of communication with Gladys Wilson, a nonverbal patient with Alzheimer's disease. Gladys is shown rocking and striking the armchair in repetitive movements when Naomi, the therapist, begins singing a children's hymn to the beat of Gladys's tapping. Soon, Gladys is tapping in synchrony to Naomi's singing. Then Gladys opens her eyes, pulls Naomi to her, and starts singing along. So this, again, um, please turn up your, the sound on your computers and um, just be patient. It might take just a couple of, um, of seconds for this to load. When people are very old and deteriorated and no one enters their world and they're just sitting there, they will withdraw inward more and more. And their desperate need for, for connection is all now inside. And if a person is all alone, even if they're very, very deteriorated, there's a longing for this kind of closeness. Mrs. Wilson? Hello. You want me to sit? Can you see me good? Gladys Wilson is a wonderful example of a person who is in the phase of repetitive motion where people use movements, repetitive movements, 
because they don't have any more speech or very little speech, but they have human needs that need to be expressed. You're crying. You're crying. You have a tear right here in your face. You have a little pain. You want me to touch you. You're very sad. Can you see me? Is it scary? Are you afraid? And if this person sits with their eyes closed, rocking back and forth, and maybe there's a tear coming down, there's a need there. Here. There's a little tear that's coming out. Do you feel it? You feel a little tear? If you right gently use right touch, here. and I touched Gladys Wilson for the fingertips right here on the cheek is where the mother usually touches a child. If you touch an infant there, it looks up, and every cell remembers where it was touched by the mother. And often that person knows, even if they can't say a word at that moment, they won't talk, but, or they don't want to talk, but they, there's, there's a communication. And that person is no longer alone. Can you let me in a little bit, you think? Just a little? You think I could be with you and Jesus for a minute? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. I used music, because when speech is gone, Music, especially with Gladys Wilson, it was religious music because there's emotion tied to it and safety tied to it. So I used her old church song. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. What I did was, when she moved, I moved with her. And when I was singing, because she didn't sing with me, so I matched the intensity of my voice to the intensity of her movement. And pretty soon, for a split second, we became one person. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So at one point, when she got very quiet and very peaceful, and my voice became very quiet as hers and very peaceful and my breathing slowed to her breathing. She pulled me to her and I moved with her. And for her at that moment, I believe I was a symbol of, of her mom. Can you open your eyes now? Do you see me? Feel safe and warm? Yes? He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers in his hands. He's got the mothers and the fathers in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. The breakthrough doesn't happen every time. The person will not always look their, open their eyes and look at you. But if you keep trying and you send, keep centering yourself and uh, really look at that person, and really mirror their movements. Maybe not this time, but the next time you come, you'll have a communication. You feel safe? You feel safe? Yeah. With Jesus? Yeah. And me? Okay. So thank you so much for listening to our presentation. I think it's going to be, everything's going to be turned over to Gwen again. 
Thank you very much, Deborah and Diana. <clears throat> you really shared a ton of valuable information with us, and I think many of us listening have really begun to think about how we have underutilized music in our practices um, and really can now see the very uh, p potential of it in working with our Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, in fact, one of our listeners wrote in uh, that she is a support group leader and also the wife of someone with Parkinson's disease, and she can't wait to try some of these techniques with her support group, uh, especially with the holidays coming. There's a lot of good music that uh, people would love to hear, and she's anxious to see how it affects their mobility. So I think you've Great. all gotten us, um, gotten us all rather, um, really thinking along these lines and, and how uh, accessible music is and how we can use it more to our benefit. So at this point, we're open to our question and answer period. Please note that questions can be submitted at any time by clicking in the text messaging box in the bottom left corner. Just type your question and then hit the send button. So we have a couple questions that have been coming in uh, throughout the course of your presentation. And I think in, uh, in light of your last video where the person had Alzheimer's disease, one of our listeners would like to know if we would expect the same results in MS and other neurologic conditions. Would you like to comment on that, please? You know, um, this is completely my opinion because I'm nurse, a nurse and not a music therapist. Um, but I would say, you know, why not give it a try and, and you know, all you can do is try um, and, and see what, what seems to work. So this Naomi Fayol is a, a social worker, as I said, and she just grew up in a nursing home um, environment because her father ran a nursing home and her mother was a social worker. And um, she just noticed the challenges and tried some different things. Um, you know, it's not evidence-based practice, but, um, you know, you never know what can work and what can reach certain people. Um, yeah. As I was uh, doing some research on the effects of music with uh, motor function, there were some generalizations made beyond uh, Parkinson's disease to other neurodegenerative conditions. I'm not sure if specifically MS would be one of those, but when you think about the effects of, of music on all different portions of the brain and that connection between hearing something and getting ready and preparing to move uh, and walk, uh, I think that there are some generalizations that can be made. We've got quite a few references where a lot of research has been done on music and mobility, and that some of those resources did go beyond the uh, application of Parkinson's disease. So I would suggest that maybe you look at a few of those, but I would say, you know, those connections in the brain are, are pretty, pretty unique, and that whole concept of entrainment and how one communicates with the other uh, might be uh, an effective strategy that could be used as part of an overall holistic plan. And another thing I'd recommend um, that's on our reading list or reference list is the 2008 book by Michael Tout entitled Music, Rhythm, and the Brain, Scientific Foundations and Clinical Applications. Um, that book had many examples of how to apply neurologic music techniques um, in sensory motor, speech, language, and cognitive training for all different kinds of um, um, chronic uh, problems. He did not just focus on Parkinson's disease, so I, I would highly recommend checking that book out. Uh, it, it gave some very specific ideas and examples. That's, that's wonderful. That's very helpful. Thank you. Here's another question that has come in. Um, Aretha Franklin once said, music is transporting. It can take you right back. Thinking about this comment, do you think using music from any certain era is important when we consider implementing music plans for those with Parkinson's disease. I, I believe you touched on this lightly when you said the person should like the music being played, but do you think it's era or likes, dislikes? Can you comment? 
I think that's very important, and a lot of research has been used on patients with dementia and the use of music, and oftentimes uh, men that went off to war and spouses were left behind, uh, and they were spent many years um, alone raising their families and, and children, and later on in life uh, developed a dementia, and music from those wartime eras or music that that couple enjoyed together in earlier years, oftentimes the playing of that music can bring that person right back to that specific moment and can kind of trigger or sort of jog their memory when conversations and words don't. So I do think it's important to consider uh, the time that they raise their families and those years when they were, did not have dementia that they developed later and think about interests that they had at that time and also likes and dislikes. You know, we were uh, kind of talking among ourselves, you know, if, if someone played rap music to me, I don't really care for that and that might throw me into a depression. But <laughs> I think certainly the person's likes and dislikes are, are really important. Great, thank you very much. Um, here's a question from our audience. Um, how does the concept of entrainment apply to how the brain connects music and motor function? Can you elaborate a little on that for us, please? Sure. Uh, just that idea of the clocks. I was so fascinated by that, by, by that um, researcher who uh, just figured out that over time the clocks and the pendulum started to move together and how that whole process worked. So that connection between the auditory part of the brain and the motor part of the brain, uh, they work in synchrony and one kind of um, helps the other. That, that idea of that asynchrony that occurs in a negative feedback loop that all of a sudden one system, whether that's the auditory system or the uh, motor system, kind of slows down or speeds up and they work together and actually uh, form a lock where they're actually uh, working together, just like the heart. If the upper and lower chambers of the heart beat in synchrony, a cardiac output is, is much better. So that idea of entrainment, the, the auditory system, which is faster, works quicker than the motor symptom and it sort of primes that region and that's why that anticipation phase where you sort of feel the beat and the rhythm um, is very effective in, um, in uh, kind of demonstrating that, that whole concept of entrainment. I was in marching band when I was in college and uh, that marching rhythm, as I got to think about it, as I th thought about that gentleman who was jogging and I, and I thought about uh, marching, um, when I hear a march, I can't not tap my foot or start moving. And, you know, the brain works the same way. As you feel that rhythm and feel that beat, uh, it makes sense that you could take a bigger step and uh, have a better balance. So that idea of entrainment is how one system of the brain works with the other. And in particular, when we hear something, that's a much quicker process in our brain than when we um, see it or uh, that tactile part of the brain. So it's, it's a very interesting concept and it's, it's amazing uh, what the brain does and how that functions. We have to tap into some of those resources. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, one last question um, for both of our presenters. Um, there was a study recently in the uh, Journal of Alternative and Complementary Therapy um, by Franco and DeLuco, um, and they looked at the practices, knowledge, and attitudes, as well as beliefs um, of healthcare providers regarding music therapy as a cost-effective complementary therapy. The physicians in their study uh, were somewhat neutral and the nurses a bit more receptive. So it, it seems to me that there's a good opportunity uh, for nursing to play a role in education on this topic and getting music more in the mainstream of care plans. Uh, so Deborah and Diana, how is, how is your work changing the way you work with your nursing students uh, to teach them and in your clinical practices? Uh, this is Diana. Um, Debbie and I actually talked about this quite a bit. Um, being a part of that SAFRA Visiting Nurses uh, Scholar Program uh, really made a huge impact on each of us. 
and we both use uh, the information that we gathered from that and um, that experience, the two days of theory and the clinical uh, in teaching our students. So for me in particular, um, I work to um, include complementary therapies before each one of my nursing classes with students. So um, to help kind of calm them, to help them forget about their previous hectic day and to really sit down and focus on the important content before them in class. So we will do um, different kinds of uh, guided imageries or um, yoga moves. Uh, I even include eyeball yoga, which they think is, is hysterical. Um, I also play music and um, talk about the importance of music and, and how music can be used to either rev them up and get them ready to go or to um, calm them before an exam or to stimulate kind of their thinking. Um, so the students, by I, the difference I found is by incorporating some of these complementary therapies, students are much more willing to use these for themselves and then to use them for their patients um, than before when I just talked about them or taught them. You know, really having that experience themselves has made a big difference. And I think uh, just thinking about music myself that, you know, I always thought of music as a very social kind of cultural experience, a religious experience. There's always music that's involved in religion and a very enjoyable social kind of an activity. But the information that we've read and looked at really has brought music from just a social, uh, fun, entertaining activity really to the mainstream of uh, therapeutic interventions. And the evidence is really present that these techniques really are effective in improving uh, a variety of these symptoms. So I think as educators, we really struggle with, you know, how do you bridge that gap between evidence-based practice and what you're teaching in school with what's happening in the real, real world? So we really, I really have incorporated um, the expertise of the, of the patients that we experienced uh, and also in our kind of day-to-day -day work of using some of the uh, complementary therapies along with uh, traditional uh, pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. But it just gives us one more tool, one more intervention to look at this person holistically and try to uh, try some new things that might be very effective for them. And build connections with our patients. And build well. connections, yep. yep. Very good points. Well, again, I'd like to thank you both, Deborah and Diana, today for your most informative presentation today and um, the, the wonderful question and answer period which followed, and certainly wish you continued success as you work with Parkinson's disease and musical interventions. You've really opened, I think, a lot of eyes and ears today uh, to, to how valuable music can be in our care of our patients. Um, while we were going through some of the questions and answers, there were a couple slides that were on the screen. Uh, one was if you're interested in applying to the Edmund J. Safra Visiting Nurse Faculty Program, the information and uh, application materials are on the website. Uh, they can be found on the Parkinson's Foundation website, which is www.parkinsons.org or www.parkinsonsnursing.org. Also, the Parkinson's Foundation sponsors the Allied Team Training in Parkinson's Disease. This is a multidisciplinary educational offering for uh, nurses, doctors, therapists, and we now do have a music therapist expert on that team. So those that are especially interested in the role of music may find the allied team training program offered by the Parkinson's Foundation uh, a very nice addition to their education.